In this week's webinar, we will discuss and explore how genetics like play an important role in something that we do almost every day, which is physical exercise. Our speaker for this webinar is Nila Bedi, who holds a PhD in exercise physiology from the University of Bahrain. And by profession, she's a kinesiogenomic advisor and registered kinesiologist. She is at the forefront of designing an innovative approach to personalized exercise for diverse populations. Using a sports genomic platform that considers individuals' genes and movement patterns, she tailors exercises to meet each person's specific needs. This approach makes exercise recommendations more accurate and highlights her dedication to promoting health and fitness to personalized strategies. Well, how intriguing is that to know? Before we proceed, I would request all participants to adhere to the following rules. Please keep your microphone muted all the times as background noise, noise can be disruptive at times. Secondly, please use a chat box if you have any concerns or questions or face any difficulties. We want to inform you that we will be recording this webinar and sharing on social media for educational purposes. Also, your feedback is critical for our improvement. So please feel free to share it with me at the end of the discussion. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Nida Khalidi. Over to you, Nida. OK. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good evening. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be here uh, to present in uh, BioNo webinars uh, with BioRO. Uh, thanks to BioRO. Thanks, uh, Simran, uh, for your nice uh, introduction to my credential. And uh, yeah, the little of uh, title of my uh, presentation is about comparing uh, we exercise versus me exercise program design, and it's about the sports uh, sports genomic uh, insights, and uh, it's about the personalized exercise for different populations, and the topic emphasizes the crucial role of our genetic makeup in uh, responding to exercise training and physical activity. Um, our data information can indicate both uh, our upper and lower limits for participating in any type of exercises. And uh, just uh, let's explore how our genes hold the key to unlock the potential within us. And uh, by the way, I'm not going to dive very deeply into the uh, topic uh, because of the time constraints, but I divided the presentation into the two parts. Uh, and in this part, I'm going to focus on the molecular exercise components. And I will explain a little bit about our evolutionary journey in this field. And I'll finish the presentation to introduce different approaches in sport genomics, especially the approach that we have in uh, BioArrow. Uh, let's uh, journey through the evolutionary milestones that have shaped our understanding of genetic influences on athletic performance. To understand the importance of exercise in our lives, uh, we must read Darwin's writings on underlying reasons for experiencing physical stress, such as exercise, because he mentions many things about environmental factors, environmental stress, just to confirm that uh, we are considering uh, stress as a part of our life. And he just mentioned something about the um, some survival theories. He mentioned those uh, who are physically unfit are more likely to be eliminated before uh, they're being able to reach reproductive age. Um, indeed, the theory of survival of the fittest suggests that the fit, as opposed to the unfit, had a greater likelihood of survival just to uh, pass their genes to the next generation. Um, 50, like 5,000 years ago, our body had already advanced to equip us for uh, upright locomotion with the uh, with an economy of movement for bipedal walking and running. And that's also helped us to distinguishing us from 
other primates. And that was very important. That, that was a very important theory at that time. Uh, throughout this journey, uh, we experienced many modifications, as you can see here. Like, uh, we experienced modification in our brain, in our skeletal muscle, in our thermal regulation uh, system, in our energetic system, and even in our uh, body for distillation, um, part of the body, that, which is important for doing exercise and to doing some upright activities. And um, these evolutionary adaptation of the human um, to some such as different phenotypes, extremely suitable, was extremely suitable for long distance running. And um, confers important implications uh, of human health and athletic performance in the present day. And we were a good long distance runners since like, uh, at least we can, we are here mentioned about the 5,000 years ago. And by some different approaches and different um, uh, factors, like the training uh, strategies with nutrition supplements and the technological innovations uh, nowadays and the genetic and epigenetics, we are uh, having, we are, we are just passing our journey uh, from the evolution to the modern day athleticism and this is the main part of the uh, our lives that if we can have the journey from the uh, from our evolutionary journey uh, from those days to be a modern day athleticism and the modern day athleticism needs these factors to improve their abilities to participate in, in different types of the exercise uh, for this purpose, uh, like we are all know that that for example, how our genetics have prepared us to be a marathon runner naturally. Like for example, I would say that we had journey from Mendel to the marathon. That's a very very simple definition of this journey. But when we when did scientists first connect genes to athletic performance? Um, in this slide, I'm going to talk, talk about the history of this field. Three decades ago, before system genetics uh, was recognized, um, Dr. Bouchard uh, began phenotyping exercise as early as 1976, when he correlated variables um, with skeletal muscle and chronological age. In 1983, he studied the genetic of physiological fitness factors and parameters uh, and heritability estimation in some uh, French Canadian families. And uh, Dr. Bouchard pioneered the integration of exercise training and genetic uh, in the classical heritage family study. This classical heritage family studies and a heritage stands for health risk factors, exercise training and genetic. And the aim of this uh, heritage study uh, was to investigate the, the magnitude of the individual differences in response to a standardized endurance exercise. That was the kind of the bicycle standardized endurance exercise. Uh, the importance of the familiar aggregation and the genetics of the response uh, level of the cardiorespiratory fitness. That was very important uh, factor. Uh, in this study, and they focus on the uh, cardiorespiratory uh, fitness factors, such as VO2 max, stroke volume, and also they work on the uh, cardiovascular disease and diabetes risk factors. And it was the first study to see the integration between the genetic variation among the families and uh, physiological uh, fitness factors. An early publish has um, like were been between 1916 to 2000, and they showed the genetic variance for phenotypes of interest to exercise science. And the later publish helped us to identify genes and the DNA sequence variance contributing to human variation exercise uh, related traits. Our understanding of the biology of exercise continued to up to like now. Like the latest published was uh, on uh, 2023, 
Uh, and the topic of that uh, published was about the molecular athletes. I really recommend to read this article uh, to everyone who are interested in this topic. Um, so it was it was just essentially a summary of the history of this field. But of course, many details are not uh, the focus of this presentation, and I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, so for here, in the genetic epidemiology literature, we are dealing with the uh, two important concepts. One is nature and the other one is nurture. From the scientific perspective, nature uh, means the biological genetic predispositions that um, impacts uh, one physical, emotional and intellectual traits and uh, physical and emotional and intellectual traits. And on the other hand, nurture uh, refers to the influences of the inf environmental factors uh, on these traits. So how do these concepts apply in the field of the sports science? Nature and nurture in the sports science refers to the debate about, for example, uh, the relative influence of genetic factors versus environmental factors on the individual's athletic performance. So uh, if you are considering like to know how um, and at what extent athlete genetics of their environment, or is it uh, what, what, in what extent athletes genetics is important or the environment is important? For example, if they are doing 10,000 uh, hours of training of like a very intense training to be an Olympic athlete or to be elite athletes, uh, are we going to consider their genetics or are we going to consider their nurture, like their exercise training regime and their plan? As you can see here, for the um, to just consider about the nature and nurture, we need to make sure that we are considering all these factors and hallmarks of the athletes. For example, we need to consider the mental factors, the gut microbiome, nutrition, a training and recovery, injury prevention and rehabilitation. Also, we should consider the equipment and the facilities that uh, are already athletes use. And also there are some social factors. Uh, we should consider sleep, chronology, and um, genetic predispositions and epigenetic factors. They are very important because uh, it's related to the prior uh, athletic experience, it's related to lifestyle, it's related to family history. All these factors can indicate for us that are we considering nature or are we considering nurture for the athletes? But we are going to uh, talk about uh, this a little bit more in other slides. So uh, here we are uh, on the opposite side of the athleticism, we have sedentarism and uh, from, the from an evolutionary perspective that I mentioned in previous slides, we have both potentials encoded in our genome. For example, our thrifty genes are responsible for promoting efficient energy storage during the periods of the food scarcity. But in the period of the food availability or using the energy dense food and physical inactivity, these genes, these gene, these thrifty genes are recognized as uh, contributors to uh, human metabolic disease, such as diabetes and obesity. An interesting aspect of these genes is uh, that they play a crucial role in the exercise response pathways within our cells. And that's interesting that uh, we need to consider teaching. We need to uh, show uh, the like make sure that we are considering different variants of these genes in our uh, exercise plan, in our uh, kinesiogenomic aspects, because they are um, the multi-factorial uh, genes that we can consider them even for the. Uh, to, to pronounce us to uh, having the disease or just think about the 
uh, physical activity uh, level and the effects of the exercise on those genes. Um, I have to talk about these two concepts, like what is the sedentarism? Like sedentarism is prolonged sitting and limited physical activity. And it is in contrast to the <clears throat> evolutionary history of humanity. So this image can show you uh, the consequences of physical inactivity and sedentary behaviors. You can see here, increasing the risk of the dementia or increasing the brain insulin resistance, increasing the risk of the cardiovascular disease or blood pressure or decreasing some uh, health factors such as VO2 max or fitness factors or increasing the mi uh, microvascular function is are the consequences of the sedentarism and also increasing the uh, risk of the type 2 diabetes or risk of the sarcopenia or decreasing the insulin sensitivity are examples of the consequences of the physical inactivity. What we are encountering with these factors all um, the days and uh, during the days as well. Uh, conversely, athleticism reflects a commitment to physical activity and fitness and it is aligned with our evolutionary past and uh, this is our choice to choose uh, athleticism or sedentarism it's fascinating that human evolution has been marked by a balance between period of physical activity and sedentary behavior as i mentioned our ancestors were naturally active and unfortunately, our generation has shifted towards sedentarisms. Eventually, it's time for us to choose our pathway. So if I'm convinced now to be physically active, the first question that comes to mind is how much exercise is beneficial for me? And what would be um, sufficient uh, and safe amount of the exercise. Uh, there are several guidelines for the public health about, uh, for example, the minimal amount of the physical activity. For example, ACSM, American College of Sports Science, and AHA, American Heart Association, recommended different uh, level of the physical activity for uh, different purposes here. For example, if they recommend for the active living, they are recommending light and moderate daily activities. If we are looking for the activity for health. They recommend a moderate to vigorous intensity exercise from 75 to 150 minutes per week. And if they recommend something for the fitness, they recommend moderate to vigorous intensity from 150 to 300 minutes per week. But you can see here, this is a graph. And you can see that if you increase your status from the, for example, you improve your status from sedentary life to active living and to the health and for the fitness, you're also gaining uh, the benefits of the exercise. But here we have the graph that is mentioning about the risk and harms. And this is interesting that, for example, this graph is a journey from sedentary life to the training and to the sport. But as you can see here, uh, this graph is the risk-benefit paradox graph. When considering the optimal amount of the exercise for good health, the also, this, this graph is also showing us the risk and harms. If we are participating in exercise, we are in risk as well when we are doing training for sports. And this is the very, very important zone for us. For instance, for example, if I engage in a vigorous exercise for an extended period, or I follow, for example, an intense exercise training regime, I may putting myself at risk, at a very, very high risk, as you can see here. And um, a risk of adverse effects of the exercise. And for example, just imagine in the worst case scenario, I'm talking about a sudden death. And you can never understand that, for example, you have the depredative position for this situation. But when we can see these harms, when we are uh, when we are beyond the exercise for fitness and we are in this zone, when we are doing exercise for the sports, here's the point. While we, while we exercise, when I'm talking about the we exercise, we are talking about 
these areas. Active living, activity for health, exercise for fitness. And this is for public health. All these recommendations are for public health. But when we are talking about me exercise, which is a topic of this presentation, we are considering individualized exercise based on our upper and lower limits. So, do I have any specific concerns that affect my physiology during exercise? Do I have any particular goals to achieve when I go to the gym for a structured exercise plan? If we have these concerns, we definitely need a tailored exercise for our life. And this is a very, very important uh, field of the kinesiogenomic. And this is the role of the kinesiogenomic. Uh, and kinesiogenomic will be immensely valuable in this zone. So the question is that, is your fitness genetic? And if it's a genetic, how we can work with the genetic? And working with this genetic, with this fitness genetic or kinesiogenomic is working with the functional genomics. And I'm going to talk about the important role of the kinesiogenomic here, an intersection of the genomic and exercise, dealing with predispositions, and also what is functional genomics. So you can see here um, a, a graph, a picture here, and I'm going to talk about this, uh, about how is the, our journey from sedentary to the active lifestyle and how is the molecular responses here, which is very important uh, in science of the kinesiogenomic. So the kinesiogenomic that I'm just uh, talking about is not widely recognized, it's not a term, that widely recognized, but it refers to the scientific study of interactions between genes and human movement or kinesiology. Uh, like this, this uh, concept and this science uh, explores that, for example, how genetic factors influences various aspects of physical performance and fitness. And in this image, we can see the real concept of the kinesiogenomics. For example, when we are seeing people in a sedentary situation and we look at the different levels, different levels of the uh, genomic, uh, we can see that, for example, if I'm sedentary, I have the tightly packed nucleosomes. And I can see the differences if I do the acute exercise just for a one single session. If I participate in a one single session, I will see a different, uh, different change in my molecular level, like in the nucleosome change, in the DNA methylation change, and also transcriptomic change, and at the end, metabolomic and phenot uh, phenotypic change. So for some, uh, some of you that uh, who might not know the importance of the uh, kinesiogenomics, I must say that it's very important to know training responses to different exercises. So we all have different responses to exercise based on our genetic. And we choose, if we choose the wrong program, we may encounter harm uh, from exercise rather than gaining the benefits. And the role of the kinesiogenomic here is to help us to understand our upper limit and lower limit, to help us to tailoring nutrition for fitness goals and also personalized fitness strategies. Like we have characteristics, we have phenotypes. For example, we have phenotypes such as the muscle size, we have phenotypes such as the muscular strength. These phenotypes are affected by different genes. And the size of the uh, these influence are different for each genes for each phenotype. For example, I would say in this table here, I'm not sure if it's really readable now. I think it's now it's better. For example, the effects of the uh, genes on the muscle size is large. It means that, for example, we will have the good effects of the genes on the muscle size, and it means that it's very important to consider the genome to understand the effects of different exercise on the muscle size. So uh, there's an adaptation uh, model for the exercise. And in this adaptation model, uh, 
it's demonstrated by the pathways and the system biology. So the current approach to understand adaptation to exercise involves molecular signatures, and these molecular signatures uh, are measurable by transcriptomic, proteomics, and metabolomics, or multiomics. And also, there is an approach for the genomic and genetic, and uh, this approach includes the sequence variants, copy numbers, and epigenetics. They are all pathways and system biology to know how we can adapt to exercise, how we can go to the fitness level and change our fitness level, and how we can understand the health and performance factors or the phenotypes. And this is very important for us because a good blend of these approaches is important to apply exercise parameters. Like we can understand which intensity of the exercise can change the molecular signatures or what kind of molecular signatures are important if we change the frequency, if we change the volume of the exercise or what uh, kind of variants are involved if I change the intensity, the frequency or any exercise parameters when I'm designing the exercise program. Here is the like example of some molecular pathways in response to various types of exercise. For example, you can see here, if we engage in high intensity exercise training, we'll have the different molecular pathways. For example, in these pathways, we have the uh, hypoxia induced factors fa that are involved in these molecular pathways. And also the PGC1 alpha are involved in, is involved in this pathway. And the consequences of that or the phenotype of that is increasing the angiogenesis, for example, or changing the fiber type. There's other pathways also for the hypoxia, hypoxia but it's involved also the mitochondrial biogenesis. And if we choose the resistant training or the concurrent training, which is like the combination of resistant or aerobic training, we will have the different pathways and the consequences of that could be in decreasing the protein degradation or increasing the oxid uh, oxidative capacity. Again, if we do the separate path, separate exercise, like different exercise, such as this is training, this is the mTOR pathway. And here is the aerobic, and we consider the PGC1 alpha and AMPK pathway for uh, gaining the benefits of this type of exercise. And these are all mentions that any acute or chronic effect, uh, a chronic exercise could have the different effects on our uh, body. And also responses in exercise are gender specific and gender dependent and it's type dependent. It's all dependent on the different parameters of the uh, exercise that we design. So, I explained a little bit about exercise and public health benefits in a few slides before. Uh, here, I'm going to highlight the me exercise and underlying reasons for that, like the personalized exercise. Due to our, uh, our genetic makeup and various environmental factors, for example, uh, we have the different nutritional status, we have a different baseline fitness level, and also, we have a different epigenetic factors and genetic variations. And at this point, when we have a different genetic makeup and different environmental factors, we will respond differently to the same exercise intervention. And this is a very important part when I'm talking about the me exercise. An individual who, uh, for example, who shows large responses to training modalities, is considered a high responder. If you can see this image here, you'll see some cyclists that are in front, and you'll see some cyclists behind them, and you'll see some cyclists in, in the very, very back. When we compare them, the cyclists in front are high responders. There are people who, res who shows the large responses to training modalities. And also we have individuals here and they show a small response as a training. And also we have some people and we have some individuals who don't show expected or typical, uh, for example, positive outcomes, a response to a standardized training. And these individuals are adverse responders. 
and they are very, very important for us. But we are talking about the me exercise. We are talking mainly about the adverse response. Actually, um, the cyclists here are not adverse responders. I'm just, uh, just, just they're just non-responders. But if I want to show that the adverse responders, I should design the cyclist just going to the opposite sides, driving the bicycles to the opposite sides of this path. So again, I want to emphasize the importance of the me exercise. There are some, some studies, for example, they tested in the human uh, that if there are high responders or low responders, they investigated people uh, to understand the effects of the long-term resistance training from the weeks to the months, and they compared the different parameters in the muscles. For example, they compared satellite cells uh, before and after exercise in different groups like uh, high responders and low responders. You can see here that, for example, high responders gain 80% facial uh, cross-section area on average, but the low responders gain nothing in their cross-section area. This is a very, very simple um, like, uh, example to show that what are the differences to gaining from exercise if we are high responder or we are low responders. And it is very understandable that, for example, if you are mentioning about the normal genetic, we are talking about the vast majority of people. But we need to consider uh, high responder and low responder or the adverse responder with a different disease or like in different situations. And when we are talking about me exercise, this we are talking about the percentage of the population that's are important. And we are going to lower, lower the risk of participating of the exercise. And this is also very common in the uh, elite athletes. If you're talking about the adverse responder, even, even we are talking about the elite athletes as well. For example, just imagine um, an individual that participate in extreme exercise effort as a marathon runners. This person and this individual experience some difficulties such as increasing the catecholamine and auto demand and the preload and afterload after the extreme exercise. And these are signs of the load on the cardiovascular systems. And also the immediate effect of those extreme exercise on the marathon runners with the, as an adverse responders could be some difficulties in the structural uh, structure of the cardiovascular system such as the right atrium or uh, right ventricular and like the diastolic, diastolic dysfunction could be the immediate effect. And actually some studies measured that to understand that this is the effects of uh, to be as the adverse responders. And the long term effect is changing the cardiac chamber size or patchy area of the fibrosis or ventricular uh, arrhythmias uh, or arrhythmias and also at the worst case scenario is the incidence of the sudden death and these are the uh, these are the uh, examples this is the examples of the adverse responders at the level of the elite uh, athletes so the public health there's a message from uh, all the studies in this field is that the public has has to stay within the safest possible territory and then we want to go beyond, if you want to go to beyond, that it will have to be personalized exercise, that we require develop tools. And this is the tools that we are going to consider uh, for personalizing the exercise. So if you are going to talk about the uh, decoding genetic or like the predispositions, um, I'm pretty sure that there are, there are many people here in, the, in this conversation, in this presentation, that they know uh, this science as well. Uh, I'm not going very, uh, I'm not going to dive very deeply in this field, but I'm going to explain a little bit about this topic because in the context of the kinesiogenomics, there are many genes and there are, the related variants are associated with exercise traits. So these variants are linked to the specific predispositions that individual may have 
uh, for certain physiological responses to exercise. And this predisposition in our genome affect performance. So that's, for example, uh, these genes can affect our endurance, strength, speed, flexibility, and, and many other uh, traits. But before going to this part, I'm going to ask uh, Simran if we have time. Can I go further or should I stop the presentation? Because you said that I have 30 minutes. Um, I think you can go ahead with like more like 10 minutes and then we can start with the questions. Okay. Because I already see a few questions in the chat box. Definitely, definitely I can finish this in 10 minutes. Yeah. For sure. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So um, to identify predisposition in this field associated with the performance genes, we must consider the SMPs or SNPs and second nucleotide uh, promorphisms. So uh, I'm sure that you know that what is the SMPs here, and we have different SMPs, linked SMP, and which is outside of the genes, which has no effect on the protein uh, production and or function, or we have the causative SMPs in genes and non-coding SMP and coding SMP, different SMPs, and make different variations here. But uh, the current approach and current methods to investigate predisposition in sport genomics, it's uh, genome-wide association studies like GWAS, sequencing technologies, epigenetic studies, and multi-omics approach and to uh, uh, measure the biological pathways, which are based on the research that they find in this area. But the, the, the only thing that we need to consider here is that the the future approach to understand the sports genomics and to use the sports genomics as a tool to design exercise program and the personalized exercise program is using the functional genomics. Functional genomics is the field of the molecular biology that investigate the function and interactions of genes within the context of the entire genome. For example, for the we have the multiomics that we already know that. Epigenomics, genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and metagenomics. And also, we have phenomics, which is the phenetics, the, the, the phenotypes that we considered uh, for the exercise. And the current approach to design exercise training program is based on these uh, phenomics, which is just considering the phenotypes here. I wanted to explain a little bit more about uh, some genes which are very important. I choose some of uh, the genes that are in the top list of the exercise genomics, but maybe I'm just going to talk about this gene, which is ACTN3. It's like out of the 251 performance-related genes that has discovered uh, up to now, I'm just um, going to talk about this gene, which is like ACTN3, which is uh, also known as the uh, speed gene. And uh, ACTN3 um, has a good association with the athletic sprinting performance. The protein of this gene produced alpha actin 3 is a responsible of the, for example, producing explosive force in the sarcomere of fast twitch uh, fiber. And this gene has two alleles, has R and X allele. And Based on these alleles, uh, we have three different phenotype, uh, genotypes here. You can see here in this table, like we have the genotypes RR, which is the full expression of alpha actinins. There are individuals who are uh, inherited one allele from their parents, from their father, and the one allele from their mother. And they are the full expression, they have the full expression of alpha actinin tree. And they are, they could be athletes with the high uh, ability to doing the high speed performance or participating in the sprinting performance. But we have also a one genotype, which is Rx, and they have this 50% of the alpha actin tree expression in the sarcomere Z line. And the XX genotypes are, has no expression of the alpha actin tree. 
And the people with these three genotypes have different uh, abilities in a sport. For example, if they have the RR phenotypes, they are, uh, they, they, their body responds to the S strength training very well or to the S sprint training. But if they are uh, the X external type, they're responding very well to the endurance training. And this is one of the genes that uh, most researchers have started the sport genomics from these genes to understand that how we can start, how we can investigate to the other genes and to understand that, for example, what are what are the effects of different genes on different sports performance. I was uh, I was trying to like I just added the AC or ACE or angiotensin uh, converting enzyme and this is uh, different genes which is related to the um, cardiovascular function. This is very important. Also these genes and also alpha actin 3 gene is also related to some disease in human, and they have some variants, which is important uh, to the sport performance as well. And the other gene that I collected for this presentation is that the col 5 a one which is the collagen type V-alpha or uh, the V-collagen gene, which is uh, very important uh, to understand the athlete's susceptibility to injuries and this is a genes that the variance in these genes can indicate that, for example, the athlete has the potential to injure from their physical activity or the exercise. But at the end, again, SMPs is not the end of the process, and we need to consider the functional genomics, and the functional genomics is the multi-omics here. And uh, like, if I'm going to like emphasize the importance of the consider genomics, I'm just also emphasizing the personalized exercise based on the functional genomic here. And this field of the molecular biology is very important for us to, um, to show that, for example, the future of the uh, kinesio genomic, the future of the uh, sport genomics is, is considering the functional genomics to design and personalize exercise. And it, it aims to understand that how genes and their regulatory elements contribute to, to the phenotypes of the organisms. It's like we can understand the phenotypes of the organism by the functional genomics, and we can understand the, how the genes are regulated in this field. And uh, the personalized approach here is again like talking about the phenotypes and the genotypes. And we have genotypes in athletic performance which these genotypes are related to the longevity, to the psychological factors, oxygen utilization, recovery and risk injury, metabolism, cardiovascular function, and muscle physiology. And also, on the other hand, we have some phenotype-based exercise. And these types of the exercise um, designing and programming is exactly the approach that we already use in the gym by our personal trainers. They are just considering cardiovascular fitness, muscle strength, body composition, metabolic health, inflammatory factors, or psychological well-being and bone health. These are phenotypes of the athletes. So um, how we can prioritize genotypes over phenotypes or integrating both, or uh, like how we can improve the precision of personalized exercise prescription. And this is the purpose of the future to personalize exercise. So throughout this explanation, the importance of the variation, variation in training responses is uh, just to develop the comprehensive approach for the exercise. So I have the notes that I have to finish the presentation, but the last slide is that we are doing, we are going to do the precise exercise at Bayar with different approaches here, and we are available for these services. Uh, I'm very glad that I'm part of this, and we will definitely uh, do the best platform in this area. And the take home message is that, like, we need to say the fitness is not the destination, it's a journey. And we need to understand that who decides when you are done. So I'm concluding by this slide and uh, thank you for your patience. And I think I uh, just over the time. Thank you so much, Nita, for sharing the information. It was wonderful.
Uh, we do have some questions in the chat box if you can address them. Yep. I've seen the chat, yeah. Just give me a second. So yeah, people are curious to know. <laughs> yeah, 10,000 uh, 10, hours, like, this chat is moving. Yes, this is a statement that if some people can do 10,000 hours, it is the, this is the average amount of the time that the elite athletes spend to be a mastery, a mastery in, the, in their sports. Um, and this is, this, is the, this is the things that happen in the sport, that uh, there are some restrictions for that, and we have some athletes that they did less amounts of the time. And this is how we can explain genetic in this field. For example, if somebody do 5,000 hours in their life to get the mastery, and if somebody should do 10,000 hours, this is exactly the kinesiogenomics. This is the, the topic that we need to consider the genetics to get their mastery, to get their elite athletes. So, uh, so do you say what to we to max or what vo2 max means the vo2 max is the the maximal oxygen capacity or the, the maximal oxygen uptake which is the uh the amount of the oxygen that we can utilize during the exercise and it can show us for example uh, how is our uh, cardiovascular capacity how is our aerobic capacity to utilize oxygen oxygen uh, when we are using oxygen as the main source to produce energy. I hope I answered your question correctly. Uh, Dr. Raja asked for inheritance of epigenetic markers. Yes, exactly. Dr. Raja said, for inheritance of epigenetic markers, are you suggesting that those who do not exercise are passing on epi markers to offspring, which would reduce the exercise tolerance of the offspring? That's exactly true, Dr. Raja. They are just um, passing the, the thrifty genes, the, uh, the worst genes that they can transfer to the offspring because of, and also the offsprings by the research results, the offspring has the uh, less uh, fitness level. Even if they never uh, been in this life before their birth, they have the lower um, fitness level after birth. We also have one more question about the Raja. And uh, yeah. Asked that if, yeah. yeah. Uh, if the kinesiogenomics of an athlete does not make them suitable for a particular exercise, can epigenetic modification help? Yes, for sure, epigenetic modification can help help them to participate and adapt to the exercise. But we can't uh, go beyond their upper or lower limits. If if we consider their lower limits or their upper limits, we can't go beyond that. We can just do modifications just for their suitable and the possible uh, efforts they can perform in their sport. And Dr. Kapoor, thank you so much. Uh, what should an athlete do if they want to participate in uh, an increased exercise? So uh, based on their purpose, if they're athletic and uh, if, they're, if they're athletes and they do the athletic performance in different levels, Based on the levels of their participation in the exercise, mm -hmm. they can also increase their exercises. They can increase the exercise parameters to get more gain from those exercises. It depends on the what, what is the purpose of the athletes if they want to improve themselves. I hope I answered the questions properly, but yes. yeah, thank you so much for your patience and Pay attention to the presentation. Thank you so much, Mira, for like answering all the questions. It was an amazing presentation. I believe each one of us enjoyed it thoroughly. It was so informative. 
So I would like to genuinely thank you for taking time out of your schedule and like preparing this presentation and showing it to everyone. And also our virtual audience for being so supportive and so nice to our presenter today and asking such wonderful questions. It really means a lot to all of us. And I hope you all enjoyed this webinar. And also we have another webinar coming on 31st January with Alia. It would be on psychology and IBS. So I'll hope to see you soon, everybody over there as well.